brothers and sisters, family, friends, and neighbors, we are gathered together today to pay honor and tribute to a choice daughter of our Heavenly Father, Sister Rebecca Carr Lewis. Thank you for attending with us today. We recognize that many of you have traveled long distances to attend these services. The family is grateful for all the expressions of love and support that they have received. At this time, we ask you all to silence your cell phones. Presiding at this meeting today is President Jonathan Frank of the Midas Creek Stake. We thank him for being here today. My name is Bishop Boyd Roberts of the Midas Creek Seventh Ward. I'll be conducting the services today. The family prayer was offered by Matthew R. Lewis, a son. The organist for today's services and for the prelude and the postlude is Sister Heidi J. Alley. And our chorister today is Sister Ruth Johnson. We appreciate their help today. The opening prayer is Each Life That Touches our, Ours for Good, hymn number 93. After we sing that, we'll have the invocation by Daniel John Lewis, a son. Father, we are thankful as friends and family to honor the life of Rebecca Carl Lewis. We ask that your spirit be with us, 
and those in the, in the program. Give them the comfort and clarity of mind. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Brother Lewis. We will now hear a life sketch by Cecily Anna Lewis. After that, we'll hear memories from Deborah Carr Bowman, Jonathan Andrew Armstrong, Thomas Eugene Lewis. Uh, following those memories, we'll have a musical number, Savior, Redeemer of My Soul, sung by Sarah Jane Alley, daughter, Rebecca Lewis, violin, and Heidi J. Alley, piano. We'll go to that point. Rebecca Carr Lewis returned to her Heavenly Father on June 22, 2018, after a battle with cancer. Rebecca was born the fifth child and third daughter of righteous parents, William Cecil and Naomi Cotton Carr in Provo, Utah, November 23, 1946. Her siblings were William Charles, Russell Owen, Mary Eleanor, Ruth Ann, and three years later, her sister Deborah was born. Her first 10 years were spent in the Lakeview area west of Provo. At the beginning of her fourth grade, Rebecca's family moved to Punalu'u, Hawaii, except for Charles, who was serving a mission in New Zealand. Her fourth and fifth grades were spent at Hula Elementary School in Kahuku School. Her primary school days were completed in New Zealand at Hillcrest Primary School in Hamilton East and Meroa Intermediate School. The next two years, she attended the Church College of New Zealand in Templeview, where her mother and father were employed as teachers. She felt it was a great opportunity to have been taught by both of them in a classroom setting. Rebecca and her family returned to the US and she completed her junior and senior years at Orem High School and also graduated and received a four-year certificate from the Orem High School Seminary. From 1964 to 1967, Rebecca attended BYU, graduating with a degree in home economics education. Eager to use her education, Rebecca began teaching in Rexburg, Rexburg Idaho, just five days after graduation. While in Rexburg, she married her first college sweetheart, John Leslie Armstrong, December 15, 1967, in the Salt Lake Temple. The next four years, they lived in Orem, Utah, Boulder, Colorado, Kenai and Anchorage, Alaska, and Park City, Utah. Two sons were born, John Andrew and Sandra Christian, before they divorced. For 10 years, as a single mother, Rebecca was blessed to be a stay-at-home mom and at the same time pursue a graduate degree in early childhood education. Following completion of her degree, Rebecca taught at BYU and Weber State University. On August 19, 1982, her prayers were answered and her dreams fulfilled when she married her wonderful, faithful, loving husband, Joseph Ronald Lewis, in the Jordan River Temple. Thereupon becoming stepmother to three wonderful sons, Joseph Benjamin, Daniel John, and Thomas Eugene. The couple added their sixth son, Matthew Ronald Lewis, and completed their family with two beautiful daughters, Cecily Anna and Sarah Jane. Rebecca was active in the Daughters of the Utah Pioneers and enjoyed developing her talents as a watercolor artist. She delighted in sewing and made 31 wedding dresses and numerous other articles for family and home. Rebecca's life was filled with service to others as she made the world a more beautiful place by sharing her talents. Throughout her life, Rebecca was blessed to learn, serve, and be taught in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. She began serving in church organizations as a primary teacher at age 13. Rebecca loved every calling, visiting teacher, young women's instructor, Relief Society teacher and president, gospel doctrine teacher, state primary president's counselor, and seamstress in the Ochre Mountain Temple. Her family and the gospel of Jesus Christ were the focus of her life. Rebecca left us with this testimony. I love my Savior Jesus Christ and my Heavenly Father. All my blessings throughout my life have come from them. I have followed God's plan for me. Rebecca is preceded in death by her parents, two brothers-in-law, and one sister-in-law. She is survived by her husband, Joseph Ronald Lewis, and her eight children, Joseph Benjamin and his wife Evelyn, Daniel John and his wife Judy, John Andrew Armstrong and his wife Jamie, Thomas Eugene Lewis, Simon Christian Armstrong and his wife Cheryl, 
Matthew Ronald Lewis and his wife Sandy, Cecilyanna Lewis, Sarah Jane Alley, and her husband Michael. Her posterity includes 28 and a half grandchildren and 14 and a half great grandchildren. grateful to be here to represent the Carr family. I'm Rebecca's younger sister. I'm grateful to be so. Um, in the last few days, I've collected a few memories from my siblings. The first one I'd like to share is kind of an interesting one. On the lighter side, a little. When she was a little girl, apparently she was given a pair of gloves she did not like. But she did not want anyone else to have them. And so she cut them up and threw them away. <laughs> I, I tell that story simply because it is so completely not Rebecca now at this point. First of all, she wouldn't cut them up and throw them away, but she was so giving. In fact, the words from siblings were that she was so tremendously giving and sharing, the one who was the glue in our family. Um, she invited us into her home numerous times for sibling luncheons. These were a delight to all of us. I, I looked forward to each and every one of them. Um, as has been said, she had many talents. Her sewing was wonderful. Mary said anytime she had a question, even as good as our mother was at sewing, she turned to Rebecca. And I called her on a number of occasions asking her how to do something for a sewing project and helped us. Not only did she make those wedding dresses, she made baby blessing dresses, and she also made dresses and suits for family members, for dances, for recitals, for awards, all those kinds of things. And it was a great blessing, something that she shared that she did not keep to herself, and we certainly appreciate that. Um, and one of my sisters said, and it's true of all, that whenever there was some family occasion, Becky and Ron made the special effort to be there to be supportive of family. She, um, she taught art and shared her talent in that way, and was able to have a number of, of wonderful awards in that regard. With the wedding dresses, some of her wedding dresses were taken to the state competitions and received blue ribbons. One of the things that I particularly appreciate is that she um, not only did the painting herself, many of those paintings hang in her siblings' homes and children's homes, and I, I'm forever grateful. But she invited me to go to watercolor workshops with her. I have some talent, but not nothing like Rebecca's. She honored me, however, when I painted a picture of the home that we grew up in, in Lakeview. And she put it on her wall. It's kind of like Grandma Moses compared to Rembrandt um, with Rebecca's in mind. But she was so sweet to, to, to be gracious enough to hang that in her home, despite the fact that she could have done, oh, so much better. I want to share a couple of things that are less tangible that she taught me over the years. She took her time. As I said, she attended baptisms, plays, all kinds of things for nieces and nephews and extended family. But in telephone conversations with her a number of times, there were some things that were very special to me that taught me the gospel that she loved so greatly. The first one refers to Doctrine and Covenants section 59. And we were talking on the phone one day, and she said, Thou shalt thank the Lord thy God in all things. She could have complained throughout her life. She could have complained particularly at the end when she was suffering so greatly. But she did not. In fact, Ruth said, she said, I am so blessed, even in her pain. And she recognized the Lord's blessings. When she told me that, thou shalt thank the Lord thy God in all things, I questioned that. I thought, no, I can't thank him for the rotten times I'm having. But she taught me that, yes, 
that there is something to be gained, something to be learned, something to be grateful for in all things. She taught me also as we had a conversation about Alma chapter, 20, chapter 7, verse 11, where it talks about the atonement of Christ and the things he suffered for us, not just for illness, not just for sins, but for all things. In fact, she said, even marriage things. And I thought, how great a blessing that is that she could teach me that principle, and I love it. As I said, she was a glue in our family. She's the glue in her family, keeping her children together. I want her children and grandchildren to know I know that she loves you with all her heart. That love continues, and she will be a strength to you, despite she is not right here with you, Ron, and the rest. She loves you, and she will be working for you on the other side. I have a feeling that my father had something to do with her passing, not with her illness or anything. But Becky always had Grandpa's hand just wrapped right here around her little finger. She could get things from him that nobody else could. And I think he was anxious to get her back and anxious to see the suffering stop and welcomed her with open arms. I'm grateful to be her sister. I'm proud to be her sister. I hope you will always be proud to know that she called you friend, mother, grandmother, husband, cousin, whatever. She loves you all, and she's looking out for you. I'm sure of that. I say these things knowing that Rebecca has a full testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of its leaders, she read the ensign every time from cover to cover as soon as she got it. Knowing that she had a testimony of our Savior, of our Father in Heaven, and of us leaders here on the earth. And I do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. My mother was the best. And when I mean that, when I say the best, I mean the best mom, at least for me and for my siblings. I think we'd all agree with that. She didn't take being a mother lightly. Um, it's what she wanted to be from the time before any of her children were born. And she worked hard at it. She got her first degree at BYU in home economics, which is why I know how to cook. And I knew several recipes for things such as spice cake from scratch when I was less than 10 years old. I knew how to iron a shirt and how to thread a bobbin for a sewing machine when I was seven. I wasn't really good at basketball. <laughs> it's also likely where I got my appreciation for reading, art, foreign culture, food, history. Um, she carefully taught us where we came from before we were born and where we are going after this life ended and our place in that. When she was going back to BYU to get her master's degree in her early childhood um, development in education as a single mother, at the time she taught my brother and Sam, Sam and I how to make dinner two days a week when she had late classes. I knew how to use the stove, which was my sacred responsibility because I was six. And Sam was only four. And so he was relegated to salad making duties. And uh, that was still a big deal because he had to use a knife. <laughs> I could make three recipes. Tuna casserole and sukiyaki were a couple of them. I can't remember the third. Yes, she taught us how to make Japanese food as young kids because she wanted us to be ready to serve missions anywhere in the world, and we did. As time went on, she found us a new stepfather and sweetheart who she expanded her family with. And she continued to share her talents and to teach her children. She loved being a mother so much that due to a medical issue that was finally resolved, she welcomed our two younger sisters into our family when she was at least what we would call in our time older. <laughs> Cecily was born while I was on my mission in Korea and Sarah came when Sam and Thomas were on, on theirs. I always teased her that uh, she better not be thinking about it when, when Matthew went on his. <laughs> Um, she taught Matthew and Cecily and Sarah all of the things that she taught us older kids, 
but she also became there and many other kids 4-H leader. And I think most of her kids and many of her grandkids have ribbons adorning their walls from the state fair and from 4-H competitions because of what they learned from mom. I will say that Sam and I thought it was a special treat to, to get a, a loaf of store-bought bread <laughs> or clothes that were not sewn by mom. Um, she built family, and like her mother before, she welcomed many into her life as family, even if they weren't her own children. She took her role as a mother seriously and went out of her way to fill that role with her stepchildren and with her sons and daughters-in-law to make them feel as if they belonged. Having raised her own Brady Bunch family, she was also very careful to make sure that her step-grandchildren always felt just as loved and welcomed into the family as her grandchildren by birth were. My wife, Jamie, and I were married four years ago, and mom never failed to recognize not only her grandchildren's birthdays, but her step-grandchildren as well with a nice Carter party. Um, my son, Chris, is here. And yesterday at the viewing, I was talking to a few people who had cards that were written last week by mom, thanking them for a meal, or um, Chris's birthday was a few weeks ago. And she wrote a, a note and a letter that's still on the counter. Um, I remember the first Christmas Jamie and I and our four teenage kids spent together a few years ago. We went into our living room that morning and there were all four of our kids wearing fuzzy pajama pajamas that mom made and um, each of them had gotten a pair and were excited enough to go and change. What mom was, was a legacy builder. Her entire life is a testament to that fact. We'll miss her so much and each of us need to remember that family was mom's life and more than art or cooking or sewing or music, that is what she would like, most like us, to have learned and to remember. Um, as we move forward on this earth with one another until each of us rejoins mom and grandma and grandpa and those others who have left us here on the other side as a family. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. She was my stepmother, but she was also my friend. To me, her life demonstrated what is important in life and what is not. And what was important to her almost always involved the people around her, especially her family. She never assumed people knew how much she loved them. She would let them know, writing letters at night, often falling asleep. Um, for years, she would do this. Uh, one of the lessons I learned from her was that success in, in things that matter most is our duty. That included education and lifelong learning, um, which actually was instrumental in me deciding to go to graduate school. Um, she worked hard every day of her life, and mostly for the success of her family. In word and deed, she was determined she was exact, she was, she was thorough, and I even liked her cheesy potato eggs. They were good. Um, a couple of Christmas, uh, Christmases ago, she took on the task to make pajamas for the whole family. And uh, she hadn't taken my measurements, um, but they fit perfectly. And they're very comfortable, and they turned out to be my favorite. <laughs> And when I asked her how she pulled that off, she said she used the, the, um, the pattern um, from a teenage girl packet. So. <laughs> it was good to know that I had lost my figure. Um, in May of 2018, she began to fill out questions in a book entitled 300 Questions uh, to Ask Your Parents Before It's Too Late. One of the questions was, what special proverbs have been passed down 
in your family about how to make it in life or how to have peace of mind. She always wrote in cursive, and uh, it was hard for me to, on the first read, to make out what it said. And I thought it said, it's better to make out than to put out. <laughs> and Sarah helped me interpret it correctly, which <laughs> it's better to wear out than to rust out. <laughs> and she, every day, um, was an example of that. Uh, another question was, what motivates you? One word, love. Another question was, are you afraid of dying? No, I will miss my family. But I will watch and, and hope um, to influence them for good. Even after I'm gone, I hope to continue to comfort and guide and let them fill my life. In the weeks um, before her passing, there appeared about the, <clears throat> the kitchen sink. Um, And two phrases. I can do hard things, and come what may, I love it. Well, sir.
more than 40 years ago. <clears throat> when I was about three or four years old, I remember waking up early and finding that mom was not home. <laughs> um, Drew and I had been left all alone. Um, I had a little bit of panic then. It went away when she came home just a few minutes later. Um, at the time, uh, I learned fairly soon after that that uh, the Johnsons, who are actually here today, were listening through the wall of our fourplex to make sure that nothing was happening and the building wasn't burning down. Um, Mom was at the temple. Being a student and a mom, she had very little time to take care of us and attend the temple. But it was important enough to her that twice a week she would get up early and attend the first session so that she could be home with us for just a little while before going to school. Um, Mom had a lifelong commitment to temple work and service. <laughs> when we were young, we regularly visited Temple Square and actually went pretty far out of our way when we traveled to attend other uh, temple sites and see other temples that we hadn't been to. Um, we learned about our ancestors like Zadok Nap Judd, whose Mormon battalion journal entries became our, uh, our bedtime stories, and whose name was later given to Matthew's son. We learned about doing temple work for those ancestors, and Mom taught us about the joy that they would have when we did their temple work for them. Later in 1999, I was able to attend our cousins Chris and Amy's uh, sealing ceremony in the Mount Timpanovas Temple. My mother's love of the temple and the lessons she taught me prepared me and were a fairly good reminder to be worthy to enter the house of the Lord. After Chris and Amy's ceiling while standing with my mother and my grandmother, I noticed a fairly attractive young lady coming past the recommend desk. And uh, of course, after the appropriate awkward note writing and introductions in the temple, um, yes, I picked up a girl in the temple. <laughs> um, things progressed and we've been married for 18 years. Because of my mother's love of the temple, the standard for my life and for eternity was set. Thank you, Mom. We just heard from uh Samuel Christian Armstrong, uh, son. We will now hear uh, from Cecily Anna Lewis, daughter, followed by Sarah Jane Alley, a daughter. Following that, we'll have a we'll hear a musical number, "All That I Were an Angel," sung by Matthew R. Lewis, son, accompanied by Sandy Lewis, a daughter-in-law. Following that musical number, we'll hear from Rebecca's brother, William Charles Carr. Over the past few months, I have learned a few new things about my mother. Um, that book that Thomas mentioned had a couple of stories some that I hadn't heard. One about secretly shopping for her first brassiere, one about missing her dog when she moved to Hawaii. Um, and those are new things that I learned about her before she passed. 
But something that was never a question in my mind is that my mother had a testimony of Jesus Christ. I can confidently say that there wasn't a Sunday in our home where we were not listening to scripture or hymns. There was always a picture of Christ on the wall and scriptures and quotes from modern day prophets everywhere in our home. She lived every day of her life trying to be more like Christ. And she set that example for all of us. And I know that as a friend, she served and, and did everything that she could to live her life by him. And I am grateful for that. I'm grateful for a mother who set that example for me. And I hope that I can live up to that. This is in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Doctrine and Covenants 88, 118 says, And as all have not faith, seek ye diligently, and teach one another words of wisdom. Yea, seek ye out of the best books words of wisdom. Seek learning even by study and also by faith. Organize yourselves, prepare every needful thing, and establish a house, even a house of prayer, a house of fasting, a house of faith, a house of learning, a house of glory, a house of order, a house of God that your incomings may be in the name of the Lord, that your outgoings may be in the name of the Lord, that all your salutations may be in the name of the Lord, with uplifted hands unto the Most High. There are so many words within this scripture that illustrate attributes of my mother. She was a teacher, a lifelong learner, and studied both intellectually and spiritually. She had a teacher's heart. She taught primary children, school children, 4-H groups, college students, friends, Relief Society groups, and her own children. She loved to read. In fact, my siblings can attest to the fact that when she was reading, she loved reading so much, sometimes it was hard to get her attention. She was always engrossed in a good book. She loved literature and often quoted Shakespeare and other poetry. Um, one of her favorites was I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud by William Wordsworth, which talks about golden daffodils, which were her favorite. Her love for and knowledge of the scriptures blessed our family. As she frequently taught us from the scriptures, uh, we, as we sat around the dinner table and we had many dis gospel discussions, she sought to learn new things. However late in the game she arrived, <clears throat> she found a love for watercolor painting when she accidentally signed up for the wrong continuing education class 17 years ago. She just decided to stick with it. And we're glad she did. Um, when she was a little girl, her uh, she liked to draw, but she gave up when her sister told her that her drawing of a horse shouldn't have udders. But we're glad she overcame that, even though it was a little bit later. Um, she took piano lessons for a time. She learned to reupholster and refinish furniture, um, which is one of the things I love to, to do with her. Um, she could make a pattern for and sew just about anything you showed her a picture of, which is how many of those wedding dresses came to be. Um, she learned to arrange flowers, and she brightened the lives of many with her creations. But most importantly, she found joy in learning the gospel principles that she learned through action, which is a prime example of study by faith. At least once in her life, she first paid her tithing when she didn't have enough money for rent and food. But blessings followed. Things somehow worked out. And she taught this principle over and again, over and over again. It was this exercise of faith that helped her gain a knowledge of the blessings that come from paying tithing. And this is just one of many of her beloved gospel lessons. Lastly, Mom made sure that our house was a house of prayer. Every morning before Matthew, Cecily, and I left for school, we would kneel in the kitchen as a family for prayer. She always prayed for her children and grandchildren by name. Each evening, we would again kneel for a family prayer. I will treasure the time that she spent praying with me when I was little. We would kneel beside my bed each night before she tucked me in with a song and a story. She started and ended her day with prayer, and she taught her children to do the same. Over the past few months, I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with my mom. And one morning, while eating breakfast with her, she offered a blessing on the food, and in her prayer, she thanked Heavenly Father for her trials. 
This is such a typical example of my mom and her, her humility and weakness. She was humble even during her hardest physical suffering. Through her life, she was willing to submit to whatever Heavenly Father wanted for her, whatever he had planned for her, no matter how difficult it was. She was a noble lady, and I will always cherish the legacy she left. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. to a red-hot hell. Sixty years ago, coming out of an LDS chapel in Auckland, New Zealand, I saw that message on a sign being carried by a bearded man dressed in a flowing robe as he walked back and forth in front of our church. What a dire warning to us as we left our Sunday morning meetings that day. Contrast that 
with this invitation from our Savior. Repent of your sins and be converted, that I may heal you. Yea, verily I say unto you, if you will come unto me, ye shall have eternal life. Behold, mine arm of mercy is extended toward you, and whosoever will come, him will I receive, and blessed are those who come unto me. What a joyous difference, an offer of healing, mercy, blessing, and eternal life. From you as the Savior of all, to all of us who will hear and be converted. My little sister Becky wanted either me or my younger brother Russell to talk briefly to you about repentance and forgiveness. We drew straws and I won. I think her thoughts as her life here on earth drew to a close was focused on her family. Rob, the children and their families, her brothers and sisters and their families, etc. She wanted us to be with her in our next estate as an eternal family. And she knew that for this to take place, we all need to repent of our sins, big or little, frequent or infrequent. And of course, without passing judgment on the rest of you, I suspect that repentance is a principle for all of us to consider and act upon. Our family has, our Heavenly Father has a plan, often called the great plan of happiness, by which we can all return to live with Him as eternal families. I testify that this is true. We knew about this plan before He came to earth. We knew that when we came here, we'd be faced with opposition in all things. We knew we'd have to make choices between good and evil. We knew we would sometimes make wrong choices. We knew that with our sins, we would not be able to return to live with Father, but we also knew that Father would provide a Savior, His only begotten Son, whose atonement and infinite sacrifice could take away our sins and make us fit to return to Him. All of these things we knew before we came here. We know that Christ's atonement and sacrifice, however, is conditioned upon our repentance. So we have frequently been invited to repent by our Latter-day Prophets. Hear what two of them have said by Elder D. Todd Christofferson of the Quorum of the Twelve. The prophetic call to repentance should be received with joy. Without repentance, there is no real progress or improvement in life. Only repentance leads to the sunlight, sunlit uplands of a better life. And of course, only through repentance do we gain access to the atoning grace of Jesus Christ and salvation. Repentance is a divine gift, and there should be a smile on our faces when we speak of it. It points us to freedom, confidence, and peace. Repentance exists as an option only because of the atonement of Jesus Christ. It is His infinite sacrifice that bringeth about means unto men that they may have faith unto repentance. And Elder Dale G. Renlin of the Quorum of the Twelve said this, Changing our behavior and returning to the right road are part of repentance, but only part. Real repentance also includes a turning of our heart and will to God and a renunciation of sin. Yet even this is, in complete, is, is an incomplete description. It does not properly identify the power that, must, that makes repentance possible, the atoning sacrifice of our Savior. Real repentance must involve faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith that He can change us, faith that He can forgive us, and faith that He will help us avoid more mistakes. This kind of faith makes His atonement effective in our lives. We then turn around with the Savior's help. We can feel hope in His promises and the joy of forgiveness. Funerals are a time for remembering. They're also a time for taking inventory of our own lives. How do I measure up? What memories will I leave behind when I follow Becky on the next step in my journey? 
I suspect that each of us has had bad actions and bad habits that we wish we had done or could do differently. Some big deals and some little, some sins of commission, some sins of omission. Someone has said, you can't go back, just move forward. But this isn't true. Through true repentance and the atonement of our Savior, we can go back and erase our mistakes, as well as overcome continuing temptations. President Boy K. Packer, in his last talk before he passed away, a general conference in April of 2015 said this, and I think this is the most critical part of our message, his message, their messages. The atonement leaves no tracks, no traces. What it fixes is fixed. It just heals, and what it heals stays healed. The atonement which can reclaim each one of us bears no scars. That means that no matter what we've done, or where we've been, or how something happened, if we truly repent, the Savior has promised that he would atone. And when he atoned, that settled that. The atonement can wash clean every stain, no matter how difficult, or how long, or how many times repeated. Or as Elder Rundlin put it, because of the atonement of Jesus Christ, we have another chance. So as we take stock of our lives, what changes need to be made? Do we want to be forgiven? Do we want to make changes in our lives? Do we want the power of the Savior's atonement to help us make these changes? Are we willing to seek or perhaps even plead? for his forgiveness and for his help in making necessary changes? Are we willing to recommit our obedience to him as we committed obedience to him at our baptisms? As we take the sacrament each week and think about this next Sunday, are we truly remembering his sacrifice? Are we ready to witness to our Father that we truly take upon us the name of his Son remember him, and will keep his commandments. With true repentance as our preparation, we then become clean again as we partake of the emblems of his sacrifice. What if we stumble and fall despite our desire and effort to change? Quoting again from Elder Christofferson, Surely the Lord smiles upon one who desires to come to judgment worthily, who resolutely labors day by day to replace weakness with strength. Real repentance, real change, may require repeated attempts. But there is something refining and holy in such striving. Divine forgiveness and healing flow quite naturally to such a soul. For indeed, virtue loveth virtue, light cleaveth unto light, and mercy hath compassion on mercy and claimeth her own. I know that our Heavenly Father and the Son Jesus Christ know us, love us, and want us to return as eternal families to be with them. I know that Jesus Christ is my personal Savior and that through his great sacrifice has made it possible for me and for each of us to repent and be completely forgiven of all our sins. He has promised, Behold, he who has repented of his sins, the same is forgiven, and I, the Lord, remember them no more. I love, I love my little sister Becky. I love the way she lived her life, the life of service and love a life of creating beauty for others to enjoy, a life of obedience and where necessary, even true repentance. She is with mom and dad now. I know we will see her again and that we can be with her as part of her eternal family if we will but follow our Father's great plan of happiness, making the necessary changes in our lives 
receiving the Lord's forgiveness and becoming refined. Of this I testify in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Brother Carr. Uh, it's now my opportunity to share a few remarks. What a beautiful service today. What a beautiful family. What a remarkable lady. Um, I'd like to share my testimony of a, a few simple truths. I testify that we have a loving Heavenly Father that has a plan of salvation, a plan of happiness for us. I testify that uh, birth was not the beginning. Uh, we lived as spirit children of our Heavenly Father before we were born on this earth. In Doctrine and Covenants section 138, verse 56, it, it reads, even before they were born, they with many others received their first lessons in the world of spirits and we were prepared to come forth in due time of the Lord to labor in his vineyard for the salvation of the souls of men. Just as birth was not the beginning, death is not the end. In Alma chapter 40, verse 11, we read, Now concerning the state of the soul between death and the resurrection, behold, it has been made known unto me by an angel, that the spirits of all men, as soon as they are departed from this mortal body, yea, the spirits of all men, whether they be good or evil, are taken home to that God that gave them life. In Alma 11.42 we read, There is a death which is called a temporal death, and a death of Christ shall loose, loose the bands of this temporal death, and all shall be raised from this temporal death. The spirit and the body shall be reunited again in its perfect form. Both limb and joint shall be restored to its proper frame, even as we now are at this time, and we shall be brought to stand before God. Finally, in, in Doctrine and Covenants, section 14, verse 7, we learn about eternal life. And if you keep my commandments and endure to the end, you shall have eternal life, which gift is the greatest of all gifts of God. It is our privilege, brothers and sisters, to have that eternal perspective, to understand God, understand God's purpose for us, understand his purpose in the plan so grateful for our Savior and his role in that, that beautiful plan. Our purpose um, is found in 2 Nephi 2.25. Adam fell that men might be, men are that they might have joy. Our purpose in life is to find lasting peace, joy, and happiness as families and to prepare to return to live with God. That is exactly what Sister Lewis did. As I consider Sister Lewis, a hymn, hymn comes to my mind, hymn number 219, because I have been given much. As I have observed the family this week and observed her many talents, this I'd like to read the first verse. Because I have been given much, I too must give. Because of thy great bounty, Lord, each day I live, I shall divide my gifts from thee with every brother that I see who has need of help from me. It goes on, but that to me represents Sister Lewis. She had so many talents. She was so willing to share those talents. In the, weeks, in the weeks leading up to her departure, I had the opportunity to visit her and to try to attend to her needs, and man, she flipped it all around on me. She ministered to me as I was trying to minister to her. What a remarkable lady. We have a privilege of knowing and having an eternal perspective. 
We know our sister Lois is. We have an opportunity to work together as we strive to return to live with our Heavenly Father. This life truly is a team sport. We work together to try to get there. Final thought, as I thought about what to say today, I couldn't help to think of one other remarkable attribute of Sister Rebecca Carlewis. She had a remarkable ability to view others as our Father views them. Elder Renland in the October 2015 conference said, to effectively serve others, we must see them through a parent's eyes, through our Heavenly Father's eyes. Only then can we begin to comprehend the true worth of a soul. Only then can we sense the love that Heavenly Father has for His children. Only then can we sense the Savior's caring concern for them. That to me is Sister Rebecca Lewis. I testify that uh, our Heavenly Father loves us, that He has a plan for us, and I do so in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As we close this meeting, we'd like to thank the Relief Society Sisters of the Seventh Ward who prepared the luncheon for the family. I'd like to acknowledge the pallbearers and honorary pallbearers. Um, as pallbearers today, Joseph Benjamin Lewis, Daniel John Lewis, John Andrew Armstrong, Thomas Eugene Lewis, Samuel Christian Armstrong, Matthew Ronald Lewis, Michael John Alley, as honorary pallbearers, Kenneth W. Lewis, Richard B. Lewis, E. Nephi Lewis, Larry K. Ward, William Charles Carr, Russell O. Carr, D. Merrill Johnson, and V. Dwayne Bowman. The interment will be held at South Jordan Memorial Park. There will be no official cortege or formal escort. The dedication of the grave today will be performed by Joseph Ronald Lewis, Rebecca's husband. We will close this meeting by singing hymn number 134, I Believe in Christ, after which the benediction will be offered by Joseph Benjamin Lewis.
Our dear kind Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this day. We're grateful for the opportunity we have to say our farewells to a mother, a wife, and a friend. We ask that her examples that she has given throughout our lives will remain with us over time and that we will teach our children. We will always remember her each day in thought and in mind of the things that we do that we were taught us when we were younger. We ask at this time that we will be blessed as we travel and harm acts and follow us, and that we will be under thy watchful eye and thy care as some of us who have traveled long distances will be protected as we travel back to our homes and in safety. We ask the blessing that will be on the family at this time as they continue to remember their mother and the, and the things that they did, she did for them. These things we humbly pray for and ask these for in the mighty Son of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Direct. <laughs> 